When I was a teenager, I got obsessed with Jaco and somehow ended up with a pirated copy of his instructional DVD. I was so keen to learn to play like him, so I, you know, shoved it in the DVD player, fired it up, eagerly awaiting these pearls of wisdom, and one of the first things he says is this. The first thing was to learn the melody to every tune, mm -hmm. which I feel is like a ultra important. And like an idiot, I skipped right past that part. I was like, whatever, Jaco, get to the good stuff. Just show me how to play all the cool licks. <laughs> but no, I essentially ignored this advice for years. Horrible, horrible mistake. Hi, I'm Luke from Become a Bassist, and in this video, I want to show you how to get started playing melodies on the bass. Exactly how to play three of them, and more importantly, what you can learn from them. And, you know, be a little bit more like Jaco, if that's your thing. Part of what made Jaco so good was, it, was that he wasn't just a bass player, he was a completely rounded musician, and it took me oh, probably nearly a decade to figure out why Jaco said what he did about learning melodies. Now, if you know how to play melodies really well, and if you know how great melodies are phrased and how they're put together, and by the way, Jaco absolutely knew how to do this, then not only will you be a better, more complete musician, but you can also use those skills to create great bass lines that breathe, that are super melodic. And of course, if you want to play fills, then what is a fill if not a chunk of melody between two, you know, hopefully melodic and functional bass lines? And if you want a solo, that's literally playing a melody. It all stems from learning how to play melodies really, really well. But you can't expect to be super melodic if you've never played a melody in your life before. But <laughs> that's what a lot of bass players do. They completely ignore, you know, the best advice from the man himself. Uh, but learning how to play melodies, it's going to make your bass lines feel better, your bass fills fit better, and your solos sing more. The question then becomes, okay, so what melody do I start with? And in this lesson, you know, I've got three that you can learn, and each is going to teach you slightly different things about playing melodically. But first up, we've got the Beatles come together. Great melody. You might already know the bass line of this one, but that's not the melody. Here we go, Melody's gonna be up here. One, two, three, uh. actually quite simple. For most of the part, uh, most of the time rather, you're playing this F on your G string, so the 10th fret right there, and then D and C on the D string, so your 12th fret and your 10th fret. Now the um, number of Fs at the start of every phrase, that's usually dependent on the lyrics, so like, here come all flat top, here come all flat, or if it's um, grooving up slowly, da, da. so that part is going to depend on the lyrics. It's usually, you know, three or four, but then the phrase always ends with D, C, D, ba, 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 12th fret, 10th fret, 12th fret on the D string right there. Uh, now, why is this melody a good one to learn? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, this melody shows you the power of repetition. It's just the same thing for so much of the song. And it also shows you how little you need to create a great melody. The first four phrases are just the same thing, essentially. Just three notes repeated in much the same way. It's very, very, um, you know, repetitious. A lot of times when bass players want to start creating melodies or melodic ideas, uh, they want to use tons and tons of notes. And while that can work, uh, using very few notes is often the key to creating something that's really, really catchy. Now, when this melody is sung, it has the you know additional benefit of lyrics, which change the phrase just slightly every time. But what you can do is try and mimic exactly how the melody is sung on your bass. So when John sings short notes, you know, play short notes. <laughs> If he scoops up to a note, you can slide up. If he falls off a note, um, you know, you can slide down wherever you are. In short, try your best to mimic every single aspect of the melody. And this is true for all the melodies we're talking about in this video. One thing you could do to make things slightly easier for you to do this is actually, you know, read the lyrics as you're playing. Or if you already know them, that's great too. If you're thinking of the lyrics 
as you play the melody, then you're going to have a bunch of, you know, more chances to make it really, really musical. You don't want to end up, you know, playing it really dry, like... And, you know, really dry and really boring. You can really actually give it some attitude. <laughs> you know, adding in your own little kind of flavor to it, and that can be really, really fun. And then when it comes time to create your own bass lines or even your own melodies, you can kind of keep that same attitude and it's gonna be way more musical than if you kept it really dry and, you know, bare bones. I'd also really encourage you to play with the recording and get super close to how it's being sung, but apparently the YouTube gods, you know, they don't let you post Beatles tunes without blocking the video. So unfortunately, I can't demonstrate on this particular track. However, I can give you the backing track I'm using here and the tab and notation for this melody so you can learn it for yourself. So if you want this, plus the, you know, the tabs and notation for the other tracks as well, then just head to the link in the description. It's all there for free. Our next melody though is Willie Nelson singing crazy. Have a listen. Here we go. One, two, three, and... Crazy. Crazy for people so lonely. One, two, three. I'm crazy. Crazy for feeling so Yeah, this one's definitely a bit more involved than the Beatles one, but just, you know, that first part, there's tons of stuff in there that we can learn from. Uh, first of all, let's just talk about what we're actually playing first. So we're starting on this E right here, ninth fret on the G string, and then down to this G, 10th fret on the A string, crazy. Now the next phrase uses these notes, A, C sharp, E, and a high A, so that's 12th fret on the A string, 11th and 14th fret on the D, and then 14th fret on the G string. Crazy for feet. And then we get a G, 12th fret on the G string right there. And then there's a like a low A that's, you know, barely there. Feeling too lonely. F A, 15th fret on the D string, 14th fret on the G string right there. Yeah? Now, of course, the rest I've included in the PDF with all these melodies and the practice tracks and all that. But like I said, that first phrase is more than enough to kind of pick apart and learn from. The thing I really want to draw your attention to, though, is exactly where Willie is placing his notes rhythmically. This is something called phrasing. Now, check this out. This is a chart of this Willie Nelson song. And if you were to roughly notate how Willie sings this, this is roughly what you would get. But listen to how this sounds. Now, the mini piano here, <laughs> it's not doing it any favors. But rhythmically, this is very, very different to the reality of how great singers deliver their melodies, right? Willie isn't 100% in time most of the time he sings this. And that's not an accident. It's not like he just had, you know, too much of a good time before or maybe even during the show. <laughs> listen to his first phrase again and specifically listen to where he places his first note in relation to beat one. Four, one. Crazy. Yeah? He's ever so slightly late on that. Let's keep listening. Crazy for so lonely. Yeah, he's back phrasing quite a bit. One. One. Crazy for so yeah, he's, you know, some, doing something called back phrasing, which is playing quite behind the beat. And this is usually something that doesn't come naturally to us as bass players. Most of the time, you know, we get drilled to be as in time as possible, as much of the time as possible. But when it comes to melodies, those rules in certain situations become, you know, roughly drawn, very hazy guidelines rather than absolute commandments. You're actually allowed to float over the time a little bit more. And if you listen to the rest of the verse, that's exactly what Willie does. So when you're learning melodies, don't always just rely on the page if you have notation. Open your ears and listen to how they're being played, specifically with the rhythm of the melody. Uh, and also when you're learning the melody, try and mimic the time feel on the original recording 
recording as closely as possible as well. This can be harder than it appears sometimes, but once you get your mind and your hands kind of around the concept, you can have you know much more control over the time and also to create better bass lines, fills or solos that you know push or pull on the groove in a super musical way, just like Willie Nelson does with Crazy. Next up though, our final melody is Autumn Leaves, which sounds like this. Here we go, three, one. Our first phrase, G, A, B flat, E flat. So we're playing 5th, 7th and 8th fret on the D string and then 8th fret on the G. Then we get F, G, A and D. So 3rd, 5th and 7th fret on the D string and then 7th fret on the G. Then E flat, F, G and C. So 1st, 3rd and 5th fret on the D string and then 5th fret on the G string. And then finally D, E, F sharp, B flat. Open D, then 2nd and 4th frets before landing on the 3rd fret of the G string right there. Now why is this a great melody to learn? Two reasons. First of all, melodic sequencing, and second of all, the melody's relationship to the chords. Let's talk about that relationship uh, first. Now I just showed you how to play kind of the first part of the melody. We didn't really touch on the chords at all, but I just want to highlight a few things. I just want to draw your attention to these. Now look at all the long notes in this melody and let's just see, let's just kind of notice what they are against all of the chords. So the first long note, that E flat right there is happening over a C minor chord and the E flat uh, is the third of that chord. So E flat is the minor third of that C, makes sense because it's a C minor chord. Now that E flat stays the same but the chord changes to an F7. So the E flat is still in the chord, but instead of being the third of the chord like it just was, it's been transformed into the seventh of that F7 chord. Okay, interesting. Let's just keep that in the back of our minds and let's keep going. The next phrase, yeah, that ends on a D right here. And when we get to this chord, we find that uh, we're playing a B flat major seven. Now what is a D in relation to a B flat major chord? It's the third. Yeah, the major third. Makes sense because it's a B flat major chord. Now we stay on this D, but again the chord changes to an E flat major seven, which again transforms that D from the third of one chord into the seventh of the next chord, the E flat major seven chord. So we've had third turning into seventh and then third turning into seventh. Okay, you can probably guess what's gonna happen next, right? We're gonna get our next phrase. We get our C is our long note and the chord is an A minor 7 flat 5 and the C is the third of that chord and then our next chord we go to is a D7 and again that C that's in the melody there is the seventh of that chord and then finally we have the last phrase that B flat ending on the third of the G minor chord right there. Now this chord stays the same so the third doesn't change this time around but notice that every single long note in this melody was either a third or a seventh, right? Now these, the thirds and sevenths, are very important harmonic notes. They give you the quality of each chord, whether it's major, minor, diminished, all that kind of stuff, which is obviously super important if you want to create or improvise melodies that outline chord changes. Now this melody in particular does a phenomenal job of outlining the chords in a super melodic way. And I've actually covered this on the channel before, the thirds and sevenths being like a roadmap for outlining chord changes. And if you wanna learn more about that, there's a link to that video in the description. One thing that is helpful in terms of visualizing how this third and seventh thing works is just to put the bass notes on the E and A strings at the same time you're playing the melody. So you go, right there, so the third of the C minor and then seventh of the F7, the D becomes the third of the B flat and the seventh of the E flat major seven chord, the C is the third of the A minor seven flat five chord and the seventh of the D7 and finally that B flat is the third of the G minor seven chord. 
all the important notes of the chords right there. And if you want to play solos or fills that outline the harmony, thirds and sevenths are a great place to begin. Now the other thing I mentioned before is something called melodic sequencing. Now this isn't quite as fancy as it sounds. All it means is taking a phrase or a melodic idea and just playing the same kind of idea at a higher or a lower pitch. And if you look at this melody, that's exactly what happens. We get the first idea. That one. Now from the starting note, this G right here, we get small step up, small step up, and then a bigger leap. Now the second idea follows the same formula. Yeah, we get small step, small step, bigger leap. Same for the third and fourth phrases too. Small step, small step, leap, and then small step, small step, bigger leap right there. So what we end up with is really eight bars of great melody, but it all stems from that single idea. Now this is like a falling sequence where things start higher and then, pardon me, and kind of gradually go down. But you can do the same thing with an ascending sequence as well. So take the same idea, but go up instead of uh, going down. So that might sound something like this. Here we go. And then instead of going down, go up. And then keep going up. And then keep going up again. Something like that, you know? We're trying to kind of doing the same thing in reverse. Pretty cool, right? Now, why is this important for us as bass players? Well, this can be so useful for us when we're creating bass lines and we want them to feel like one cohesive bass line rather than, you know, one bass line idea over one chord, then a separate idea over another chord. Uh, and of course, if you want to start soloing, using sequences like this is a great way to take just one idea and kind of stretch it out and really kind of make the most of it, rather than having dozens of unrelated ideas kind of spewing forth from your bass. You can use one idea as the basis for your solo and weave that single idea into, you know, a really cohesive, beautiful bass solo tapestry that's going to be way more interesting and captivating than, you know, a new idea every bar or two. Now, playing these three melodies for yourself is really what's going to help you learn the lessons from them, and that's something I think I can help with. So if you want the tabs and notation for all these melodies, plus the backing tracks I'm using for this lesson, I'm giving them away for free on becomeabassist.com. Just click the first link in the description or right here, fill out the form on that page, and you can be diving into them in less than 60 seconds. So I will see you in there.